Great, and I thought we'd just take a few minutes um, while we've got all this expertise in the room to have a short um, sort of roundtable discussion. I think if we can have all the, all the speakers from today come up um, to the front desks and the chairs as well and, and just get a small discussion going, I think around the central issues, I think for today anyways, around what the opportunities and what the challenges are um, for this model uh, going forward for, I think, both understanding the mechanisms of immune control of HIV um, but also to what extent this model in its current and future forms can be used to uh, extrapolate findings and test um, some of the vaccine concepts and, and uh, contemporary vaccines that are out there. Um, so we get the speakers to come up. want to use the microphone I may not hear you I mean I'm looking at this more from from where I sit and it's more as a, a vaccinologist a product development kind of person and you know I came here because I really wanted to see uh, we, we have a lot of non-human primate studies going on and they're they're really expensive to do the kinds of studies now where everything's focused for acquisition um, that to, to get something meaningful to look at an effect on acquisition, the numbers just have the right power are, are making these experiments, um, you know, uh, very, very expensive. Um, and people trying to come in for R01s, it's just pushing the grant way over 500K. So it's just making it not feasible. So um, I came in trying to get a, a, a feel for where this model is, how we could quickly jumpstart this model and use it, you know, get it into the preclinical down selections for vaccines. Um, I, I guess, I'm, as I said, I'm just learning, but I would like to understand what other models are out there, how the, the focus today was largely on one specific model, but is there anything that NIH can do to jumpstart this to get, and I know it's hard to do head-to-head -head comparisons with other models because people don't like to do those kinds of experiments. We have enough trouble getting people to do the head-to-head -head between the different vaccines because if something comes up that doesn't work, it torpedoes their entire program. But I think it's important to for somebody to really put down what the limitations of this models are, what the strengths of the models are, try, try to you know, line it all up and see if any aspect of this particular model could be used to, to down-select and make choices on, on uh, HIV vaccines. So, I mean, I mean, that's really where I'm looking, looking to kind of get some guidance from you all in terms of where it's at. I think there's a lot of the RV144 tie trial pushed everything, the pendulum swung from T cells and Merck vaccines and ADNO back to antibody, like it or not. So everybody switched from SIV to SHIV models. And so now everybody's looking at uh, acquisition models and everybody's looking at B cell maturation. And I, so I'm really, that's another point that I, I want to see if this model really has a chance to, to really uh, look at antigen uh, effect on uh, somatic hypermutation. Can, is there even a hope that we could look at B cell maturation in these, uh, in these animals and we could give it sequential um, immunogens to drive the B cell response to making a broadly neutralizing antibody? Or is that just totally out of the question? So there's a, there's a lot of things that I I'm, I'm, would like to get some answers to. And I think everything I told Todd was uh, it would be really useful if some kind of um, synopsis or some publication could come out of this, uh, this meeting today where, you know, just where the state of the art of the field's at. I think I could uh, take a stab at some of Michael's questions. I think um, 
with regard to uh, the number of models that are out there, I think one thing that's emerged uh, from what we've done as a field so far is that if we want to model uh, de novo immune responses to a new antigen or a new pathogen, that you need, at least as of now, human thymic tissue in the model in some capacity to be able to generate uh, functional T cells and functional B cells. So I think whereas uh, that's not required for some studies of transmission and gene therapy and so forth where you basically just need to have infection and then you can modify the stem cells and so forth. Those, the non-thymus models are, I think, perfectly adequate for, for those kind of uh, therapies um, uh, and so forth. But to, for a, a vaccine platform, if we wanted to try and vaccinate animals and see if we can predict what's going to happen in the human, I think whether it's the, the, the mouse that we're calling BLT as it's uh, come out of initially Megan's lab and, and Victor Garcia's lab or a, a, a PI mouse or something, we still need basically a source of stem cells and a thymus. I think partly one of the issues is as we've started to see some uh, limitations in terms of uh, immune maturity in these mice, the way we're making them from fetal cells. Uh, we're, I think we, as Todd presented, we're seeing some evidence of uh, the ability to protect with a vaccine. I think one of the questions are is, is with a little bit of investment, could we focus on figuring out whatever is required to fully mature the B cells or fully mature the T cells. I think part of the problem, uh, at least, is getting funding to actually work on the model as opposed to using the model to answer a question relevant to HIV disease or pathogenesis or, or vaccination. And I, I think that's, you know, hasn't been as much of an interest for understandable reasons, but if, if, if there, I think with a modest investment in those type of dis investigations, we could really take this model to where it needs to be to become a real uh, viable uh, tool for investigating vaccine applicability. I don't know what uh, other panelists feel. Uh, I, I will jump in on that and just say that for 20 years now, I've been working with Len Schultz and Jax to try and make model development uh, go forward. And it is almost impossible to get support for it, very bluntly put. Uh, and I think that the model development the field is benefiting from out there right now, that's where the NSG came from, was uh, about 10 years of model development after the Nod Skid was described by Schultz in 1995. He came back after 10 more years of model development with the Nod Skid Gamma. And as you heard Dr. Brem talk, uh, there's a lot of new modifications in model development that are ongoing, but it, it's bluntly impossible to get funding for model development from NIH. Those monies have come from other sources. Yeah, I would agree with that, and I think there's a lot um, that can be done. Um, yeah, I mean, we heard about some fantastic cytokine transgenic mice, but there are others that you know, are, are either not being done or are being done by isolated groups and they're not uh, on the same NSG background or not on the same mouse. And so um, I think there is a need for more uh, tries at different cy human cytokine transgenics. IL-6 and BAF are ones that come to mind in terms of human antibody responses. But um, the other thing is we, we really don't know much about uh, trafficking of human lymphocytes. I mean, we saw some beautiful work today um, uh, from Thorsten Mempel, the in vivo imaging, um, but I don't think anybody thinks those are perfectly normal um, lymph node structures. They, mm. they have a lot of structure that is not there in an NSG mouse that's not reconstituted, but they're still not perfectly normal. And uh, there's a lot we don't know about adhesion interactions and so on that, that um, and, and cytokine interactions as well that could lead to improved structures and improved uh, homing and trafficking of human cells in, in this murine system. So there's tons of room for improvement, but um, getting, getting support for that is difficult and also 
um, you know, the sharing of the models is really important too, getting access to them once they're developed. Mike, just to provide some perspective on this from somebody who, who's been focused in the SIV model uh, and, and particularly with the question of vaccine development, I think it's, it's worth taking a moment to step back and think critically about how you would establish, benchmark, or validate this model with respect to vaccine development. Um, if you go back 20 years ago and look at the experience in the SIV macaque model, we had you know, a lot of challenges with a diversity of models, different challenge stocks, different macaque species, and then frankly a lot of uh, an inability to benchmark it towards any real results in the human vaccines. And so we didn't have either a positive or a negative control. Um, we have some advantages now that we didn't have then. We have one, um, you know, negative results in the STEP trial. We have a glimmer of, of hope, a, 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 a hint at a signal in the RV144 trial. And so that does give you some potential benchmarks for human trials. Um, based on what I've heard today, I, I mean, I, I, there's, I think, tremendous excitement about the potential of the model in general to address questions to novel therapeutics. Um, to uh, pathogenesis. There's a lot of questions that you can do in this model that just can't be adequately done in macaques or humans. I think it's still an open question to what extent the role in vaccine development will be. I, I, that strikes me as a very big question and perhaps one focus of the panel might be what if you were to, if you throw the issue of funding aside, which obviously we can't do, but if you were going to start off with the idea of, of what over the next five years could we do to benchmark or validate this model, what, what experiments would we do ideally? Would you try to benchmark it towards results in humans? That has some advantages, but you don't have a lot of data points. You've got you know, the, the, the negative trials and, and one probably positive trial. Or are you going to try to benchmark it against all the results in, in, in macaques? Do you want to take, um, say, one of Dan Brooks ad, ad 26 uh, heterologous ad um, boost experiments and see if you can replicate that in, in, in mice. Uh, and so explicitly looking at the process of model validation, I think, is very important, particularly given the concerns that, that Dale just highlighted of the challenges in funding and getting funding for model development. Um, one other question I'd like to just throw out there with all the rest is, is the question of what the throughput of the model really is. Um, in the macaque field, we've gone from, you know, I, I had a sense of deja vu here, seeing a lot of ends of threes and fours in experimental groups here. That was where the macaque model was 20 years ago, and the, and the field has changed so that in most cases that's simply not acceptable. And certainly from a statistical point of view, that's generally the case, particularly if you look at multi-group comparisons. Ends of threes and fours simply won't cut it. And we can see things that look like a trend to us, but a statistician will blow us out of the water and say, no, that's not statistically significant. And a lot of the studies today where ends of threes and ends of four is funding the rate limiting step? Can you get these things up to you know, ends of six reproducibly? Is it a question of the number of animals you can reconstitute from donors, et cetera? So I guess the two major themes I threw out there is one, what would be the intellectual benchmarks that you would set to, to try to validate this model and, and perhaps maybe just for a subset of vaccine experiments? And two, what are the rate limiting steps? Funding for model development? just a fundamental limitation on how many, how many animals you can reconstitute, et cetera. Simple questions to address. Uh, sure, I, I think the, the numbers uh, is not as much of a problem. Um, I think what, to overcome the problem of numbers, it's helpful, uh, sort of the model that we've developed here with the support of, of the CIFAR uh, initially and then uh, also with the support of the Reagan Institute is to have a central platform facility make mice for uh, numerous investigators so that every lab doesn't have to develop the expertise of making BLT mice or whatever model it ends up winning out as the best model themselves. Uh, and with that, we have economies of scale and also a you know, sort of expertise developing so that uh, our 
the people making mice for us, it's I would say um, we routinely are able to uh, reconstitute 40 mice per uh, tissue donation and sometimes as much as 100. And Vlad, what's your record? Uh, 123. So I think there, the, the numbers are tractable. Uh, and I think that having that kind of uh, sort of series of cores that if you know, Megan had a core and Dale had a core and Paul had a core, if we had a few cores around the country that we could really supply, you know, and Larissa was interested in a core and, and sort of supply most investigators. I, so I don't think the numbers are going to be problematic. Um, I think there's the issue of, of grass versus host disease and, and Megan's published some really in great work that we're hoping will really uh, make that more tractable. So I think the problem then becomes uh, how good the model is. And I think one of the things that we are interested in, in looking at the vaccines that have been run in, in humans, and not just for efficacy, but maybe for immunogenicity. And I think that would be, you know, can we at least get this model to the point where it can generate CTL and antibody on a par post-vaccination that, that we see in humans. And that, that, that might real, once we can do that, I think then we, it might be something that we can really use going forward, or at least to approximate that. So I, I, would, say, I, would, I would say numbers not a problem. I think graft versus host disease becoming more tractable. I'd say improving, further improving uh, immune responses. And I think, you know, we have efficacy of, of CTL response and antibody response already. So it's not like we're starting from, we'd be starting from scratch. Um, but with, I think, a reasonably modest investment, hopefully, in model development, we could really put this over the top, I think. I think also as far as numbers go, I mean, with humans, you need a lot of humans, but you only have one of each. And um, <laughs> I think the beauty of the humanized mice is that you have multiple replicates of the same individual. And so you can look at different permutations of, say, your vaccine and see what works best. But I think it is important to keep that distinction in mind because what works best for one individual may not work best for another individual. And so when you think about numbers in terms of personalized immune mice, um, I think you've got to think about numbers of donors that you can recruit and generate cohorts of mice from, because that's really important in interpreting anything you see. And I think just to get back to the, the broader question on vaccines, I think it's, it's really twofold. I think we, we still don't know the real mechanisms for immune control. Um, and I think this is one area where the model can be used to look at some of the germline B cell receptor aspects in terms of stimulation of that um, repertoire out into a more diverse um, repertoire that will recognize or will develop into brco one type antibodies. Um, <clears throat> similar with the T cell response, um, immune specificity in targets is critical, and yet we don't know a lot about how to induce those responses and shift immune repertoires to different regions. So I think there is a fundamental aspect of, of mechanisms that still need to be worked out where this model will allow us to look at human immune responses to HIV. Um, and I think that's one critical area. I think the other question of actually um, translating some of the contemporary vaccines is, a, is another question. Um, you know, we're at the current setting, we're dealing with a model with very high viral loads um, that are not necessarily natural. So the, the necessarily translating directly from human vaccines now into this model is, is not straightforward step right now. I think there's a lot more to be worked out in the model before we can make that direct leap. Not say that it won't be done, shouldn't be done, but I think we do also need to proceed cautiously and not just assume that we now have a model that can be used directly for um, all the vaccines that are out there. Um, and it's a chimeric model. I think that's the other thing to keep in mind is, is delivery of these vaccines and the roots is something that's going to take a little bit of time to figure out how to uh, track directly translate vaccines that have been used in human trials um, to induce those same responses. And I, I like Dandy's point. We're looking at both efficacy of vaccines and their immunogenicity. And I think that's where, again, these, the, the model may serve quite well to start to tease out these different aspects. But again, we're also looking at, in essence, a, a 
in some cases a fetal immune response and that may not be necessarily what we want to model and I think Megan's work is uh, uh, provides a nice opportunity to start to look at hopefully adult immune responses in these mice so I, I think there's a nice foundation I think we don't want to get too much ahead of ourselves I like Paul's comment that there is a sense of deja vu here uh, we can learn from it but not get too far ahead of ourselves and take uh, heed of the lessons that we learned from the non-human primate and um, proceed, you know, appropriately. Let me just follow up on that, and that is uh, what what has been said, and Lishan said it very well, I think. There's a glass half full and a glass half empty, and I think today we, we heard a lot of very good glass half fulls and there are still a number of limitations to these models that need to be worked out at very basic levels and to do that I think you need a uh, you need a core group of people asking what those questions are and what those limitations are and then focusing on trying to overcome those either through technical approaches or through genetic approaches uh, both should be thrown at it uh, and uh, those limitations uh, are still there, and until we overcome those, we are not going to have as full and robust a human immune system in these mice as you're going to have in humans. Uh, and those, that's just a given right now. But we can, I think, with time, overcome them with a concerted effort and some investment of intellect along the way. Yeah, I, I agree. I think so, too. And I mean, I think that. So the field just owes this enormous debt to Lenny and Dale for basically working out these recipient mice and now identifying human uh, cytokines where the mouse and the human don't cross and replacing them systematically. In the mouse, for instance, on our B cell side, we'd be, you know, we, it's clear that B cell development is good enough to make neutralizing antibody but not normal. And, I think, an, again, an investment in, you know, where Lenny and Dale have been sort of trying to push this themselves, if we, you know, do sort of a more concerted investment in, you know, in their systematic efforts, I think, could really bring the field to the point where it'll need to be to, to have this, you know, go forward as a vaccine model. Yeah, I, I just have a few point ways. I, I agree with Andrew about the model of choice should be with one with the thymus. It can be a thymus BLT or thymus epithelial, like uh, uh, Maglin proposed. That's probably critical for a good immune response. The second point I would like to point out is I've been working with humanized mice for almost 20 years, being asked this question all the time. But I have to answer this. No model is perfect. What we need to do is to really figure out what this particular model can reflect human disease or human vaccine response. I think the current model has some aspect we can model. We may not model the whole thing like in a person, no model can. What we need for this group is to realize which part of this response we can model. It's a question you ask. Right. It's the most important thing. A, so ask a specific question based on what the model can do. In, when we start with the thiolave model, in Michael McKean starts, then we work on the pathogenesis. Essentially, we know all we can do is study HIV-induced pathology in the thymus because it doesn't have an immune system outside the thymus. With that, Jerry, Mike, and uh, including my lab, we've done a lot of work study how HIV causes pathology in the thymus. We serve the purpose for that aspect. The same with the BLT and the normal mice. We need to see what additional question in terms of vaccine, we can do. The B, B cell part, what, I'm not sure you have the same experience. Once in a while, we will see a mouse with very good IgG response. We, we just don't know why. When some usually have more IgM than, IG, than IgG, but some animal will have very high level of specifically to, to viral antigen. We just need to understand more, I think, to. To answer your question, Michael, about can we do B cell to make it better? Yes. The question is, we need to probably resort to really focus on that.
we've run our course for today. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> is there, is there a next step then? I mean, I think it's, it's, it, sounds, I mean, it sounds to me like somebody needs to kind of put together a group on what the model can do, what the model can't do, what the niches that it will be able to address. You know, I mean, keep people's expectations reasonable so that, you know, that experiment doesn't crash it. But I, I think it's still, you know, there, there are ways to come to NIH, ways to come to NIB, <coughs> One successful model that might be worth thinking about is the neutralizing antibody consortium where there were lots of people working on neutralizing antibodies. They're, the field had sort of given up and gone towards T cells and um, IAVI in that instance funded a bunch of people like sitting around this table to really put their heads together and, and work together and it, I, I think it worked really extraordinarily well in terms of moving that agenda forward. And, and, and something like this, you know, there are funders out there that are potentially um, accessible. Um, 
if somebody has a, a vision, good idea, way to bring the whole, you know, bring a, a bunch of a sort of a critical mass together. Yeah. Well, my understanding also is that Bill Gates has now identified 92 people who are willing to give away half of their fortune. We just need one of those people to decide to put it into the humanized mouse. <laughs> Well, I, I, I mean, not to speak for everybody, but I think there'd be an enormous interest on our part in putting something like that together. Uh, I mean, to, uh, to propose to, uh, you know, in terms of a consortium to try and move the model to the next level. Well, I mean, could, could, would you two be the point of contact? I mean, this is, again, not my field. I don't know anything about animal models. Product development, viral vectors, yes, not not this. I'm not an immunologist, so I really, you, you guys got to put some very clear, concise uh, plan together of the kinds of questions you're going to ask, the status of this, and how it compares to other models that are out there. I mean, to the Regeneron model, and other ones that are out there. I mean, you know, I mean, it, it, it could be overwhelming, but I think somebody's got to take a first stab at putting it together, we could compress it into something that's doable. But you gotta, you gotta start somewhere. And, and if not, it'll, it'll just be kind of disjoint and everybody will be presenting a little, little tidbits of this, but it, it will lose the big picture kind of thing. And I think it has the eye of the division. I think, okay. you know, there's people like Michelle Nussenzweig that are getting up during the AIDS meetings and saying, you know, I, I can do these non-human primate studies and passive immunization studies and uh, pennies on the dollar versus non-human primates. So people are, are, are listening that there's, there may be other ways to get answers in addition, you know, to non-human primate studies, which you still need to. I mean, maybe the thing is to put together some kind of a, you know, working group from the people that were, that were here. Um, I wonder also, Todd, uh, Marty Hirsch had approached you about, uh, you know, just trying to collect what had been said today in terms of a bunch of, of uh, manuscripts for a JID supplement, which might also be a good way to keep the conversation going right now and, and have, have something that comes out of this meeting maybe as a stepping stone towards Right. Consortium. Yeah, no, I think if we can get as, as many of the speakers as, as possible interested in writing up a short uh, summary of their talk today and putting it together as a supplement for JID might be a nice tangible product at the end to reference, but also to work together with this group to start to put something together for, kinda, for days. Kind of just overlay it with a commentary, you know. Right. I mean, I'd be glad to help, you know, kind of mm -hmm. just add something to it that kind of establishes the context that you need. Yeah, I think that'd be fantastic. That'd be good. Yeah, and Paul, Paul will write the rebuttal. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so I guess one, one, thing I, one thing we didn't talk about is uh, the therapeutic vaccine approach to be modeled in this, this humanized model. Well, I think, that, again, I think that that's that is clear. You're right. You're absolutely right. It's and I think they're being, they're being linked a lot to the care. I mean, everything is kind of, 
kind of be enrolled, and even the clinical studies that we're doing now are going to be combinations of vaccine and you know, and then uh, and then prevention too, and then profile, you know, and then also microbicides and things like that. So I think there's a lot of different approaches to using this model in terms of a therapeutic approach, you know, to also cure the virus completely. And so I, I think it could be used as a model for a lot of different things within within the within the field. Great. Okay. Well, with that, we should probably wrap up for the day. But uh, I want to thank um, all the speakers and chairs. I think this was a fantastic day. It was great to get everyone together around this topic. Um, and thanks for everyone else who uh, stayed to the end of the day. Great. Right, thank you.